Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marco Aguilar, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Uh, before I pitch it to Cheryl, um, just want some housekeeping. Uh, if everyone can just remind, uh, remind everybody to please be on mute. Um, and please put your name and names of the friend groups that you represent in the chat box, please, uh, for that. And without further ado, I'd like to pitch it to Cheryl, who, who is with CORFA. Cheryl? Thank you, Marco. Hi, everybody from Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates. We're really happy to have you here this afternoon or this morning, depending on which side of the Rockies you're on. Um, we're going to be talking today about the mentoring program. And Joan, if you would please pull up the slide deck, we'll get started. Thanks. So your, the presenters today, I'm going to just give you a kind of an overview of what the mentor program is and what it isn't. And then we'll hear from Linda Schnee, the National Friends Coordinator, and Debbie Parisi from Friends of California Condor, Wild and Free. Next slide, please. Often friends groups aren't real sure what mentoring is. And so um, one of the things, this is one of the things that Fish and Wildlife Service does for friends groups that we, I say official friends groups, but friends groups who have entered into a partnership agreement. So that can be um, refuge friends groups or it can be hatchery friends groups. And sometimes you don't call yourself friends, but hopefully you all know that that means the the nonprofit group that helps to support the refuge or the hatchery. And what a men the, the mentoring consists of, you are assigned a team of two people usually. One is an experienced person from the Fish and Wildlife Service staff who has experience working with friends groups. And the second is a friends member. And they provide free consulting services for you is the quickest way I know of to try and describe what happens. It's a year plus commitment by your board and your service staff to help strengthen your, your friends group and also to strengthen the partnership between the friends and, and the service. Um, and when I say it's a year commitment, obviously it's not the, you're not spending every minute that entire year, but it's just I want to, everyone to understand that it isn't, um, and when we first started the mentor program, it was basically just the visit and then it was over. And now it, we continue with follow-ups uh, in, in the ensuing year after the visit. And quite frankly, I've been a mentor for, I think seven or eight years now since the mentor program restarted. And I'm still in contact with some of the first groups that I worked with. So um, it, that's why I say it's a year plus. It's a well-planned and very structured process that we go through, but it's also customized to meet the needs that you might have as a friends group and your service uh, partner. And gives you an opportunity to work together so that you're very clear on what your roles are, what the roles of the friends are, and what the roles of the service staff is. And you, during that process, your commitment to your programs and your, to your partnership are confirmed and commit and that commitment is strengthened. Um, and it also provides some guidance to help you identify what opportunities might be available to you. Next slide, please. Cheryl, hold on one second. For some reason, it's not forwarding. So okay. let me just escape and try this again. All righty. How's there that? you go. Thank you. I also want to tell you a little bit about what mentoring is not. Mentors don't come in to tell you how you should be doing things. They come in as facilitators with a lot of experience and maybe some good ideas and suggestions but a lot of the but the majority of the work that is done during a mentor visit is by the friends group and the refuge staff that work with that friends group and they come up with the ideas of how best they can work together it isn't a 
training, although there's some training that goes along with that, perhaps, of how, how you want to do things. If you have specific needs, sometimes um, I know we've done training on uh, some fundraising training. We've done training on um, recruiting and, and building membership and, you know, those kinds of things, but that it's not intended to necessarily be a training. It's more an opportunity for the friends group and the service staff to work together to strengthen the partnership and identify how they want to move ahead. It's not something that only benefits the friends group. And I think I don't have anybody here from a service staff who has participated in friend, in a mentoring uh, as one of the presenters today. But I think if you talked with the, the Fish and Wildlife staff at the, the uh, sites that have been mentored, they would tell you that it's a benefit to the service as well. Um, it does, you don't have to be having serious problems. And I know that's another thing that I've heard is, well, we're not really having any problems. Well, we're all having problems right now, probably after having dealt with a pandemic for the last three years and not and had visitor centers closed down and programs that we couldn't offer and those kinds of things. We're all kind of in a reboot phase. And so um, mentoring right now may be very opportune for many groups. It isn't only for, and you can fill in the blank, only for big groups, small groups, urban groups, rural groups. Uh, um, it isn't for only for any particular kind of group. It's for any, uh, as I said, any friends group that has um, has the desire to, to make the application and participate in the process. And it is a lot of work. None of us will disagree with that. And I'm sure when Debbie talks in a little bit, you'll know that there, the Friends of California Condors Wild and Free put in a lot of work already and they're continuing to work, but hopefully the benefit far outweighs the amount of work that you need to do. So with that, I'll turn it over to Linda Schnee, the, the National Friends Coordinator for Fish and Wildlife to talk about the application process and the selection process. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for having me. Um, I love the mentor program and uh, I'm just so happy to be involved with it uh, in any way and in a coordinating manner. So I'm happy to be here. And if anyone has questions at any time, of course, you're always welcome to reach out. Uh, so the application process, um, just to give you some overview, um, we're gonna look at the application in a moment, but uh, I will uh, make sure everybody knows that what we're looking at is the application from the last cycle, the updates and changes that we make to the application won't be um, very extensive by any means, uh, but we're still in the process of just making sure those final updates and things are done for the next application cycle, which is this fall. So the application we'll look at won't be the exact one that you will use, but it's, it's very, very close. So it will be uh, fully relevant to what we're talking about. So just so you have an idea of what the application process entails, uh, first we ask for just basic information, you know, contact information, um, who the key players are on your board and at the refuge. Um, it really does require people, both friends and service staff to think critically, um, not just, yeah, we want a visit and we don't really know what we're gonna do with it, but we'll figure that out as we go. There, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work involved in a lot of pre-work before people even get to the site. Um, but as Cheryl said, it, it's a lot of work, but I think the return on the investment is, is real. Uh, so we do ask people to, to really think critically about what, what do they want. Um, we don't want to send people into a visit without knowing what they're hoping to gain from it or what they're looking for. That doesn't mean that every single thing will get checked. And as Cheryl said, it's, you know, it's not, um, the mentors don't come in and um, solve all your issues, but they, it's about helping you figure out how to move forward. So before we get to that, we need to look at what do you want out of a mentoring relationship and visit? Um, we want people to discuss the goals from the, um, for the mentor visit and the involvement in the program before submitting the application. It's really important that people in all uh, forms and on for all parties, uh, I started saying both sides, and I don't want to use the word sides. I don't want to say the service and the friends because we're not uh, opposing sides, right? 
but we want to make sure that people from from both parts of the the mentor process and the partnership are bought in and committed to doing this before you submit that application. So the application does ask you a lot of things to make you think about this before you just send it in and think, well, we'll just see what happens. Um, it asks the applicants to describe the desired outcomes of what this what they want out of this relationship and describing um, just the basic makeup of the friends group, you know, the committee structure, very uh, generally, and it's, it's not a super in-depth look, but just wanting to make sure that people can tell us what the, what the friends group looks like and how the relationship is with the service site or program. It does require signatures from multiple parties, um, from both the friends and the service site staff. Uh, and we do ask for a selection of possible dates for a visit. Um, this, we know that this is usually the hardest part, frankly, is getting the visit scheduled because everybody's really busy and has multiple priorities and things. But if uh, during the process of completing the application, people can talk about some dates that might work. Uh, and I will say looking at dates maybe a couple of months out as well as a little further out is probably a good idea. Um, it's not the typical process that the visit is gonna happen you know, a month later. That's really very, very unusual or even two months later, um, but we don't want it to be too far off unless it has to get rescheduled. So a selection of possible dates that would work for both service staff and friends uh, members would be would be helpful. Next. Okay, so Linda, you want me to pull up the application? Sure. Okay, and thank you. Can Definitely folks see good. that? Can everybody see that? Okay. Want me to blow so it up again, some more? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Thank you. Um, and if you if you actually, Joan, wouldn't mind scrolling down a little bit so we can see those priority areas. Perfect. Uh, yep. oh. <laughs> little bit up. Yeah. A little bit more so that we can see the top two. There you go. Great. That's perfect. So again, as we talked about, you know, the purpose of the mentoring visit is, is to foster an active um, and effective friends organization and a, an effective and active, vibrant partnership. Um, so the the program itself is is a peer based program. It's not that oh the experts are coming in and are going to tell you everything that you need to do. Um, it's really about helping each other. Uh, these four priority areas I think are are useful to to look at. Um, it isn't that, oh my God, you're in so much trouble, you need to redo everything. And it isn't um, that everything is, you're not, but also you're not, like Cheryl said, it's not, we don't want it, people to think of it as like, oh, this makes it look like we're in a really bad space. And we don't want people to think that things are so bad that we need mentoring. I really feel like it's a sign of strength and commitment to the work that you're entering into a mentoring relationship. So these are the four areas, um, the sort of priority areas that a friend's uh, mentor visit and relationship are um, designed to address. One is really core management. You know, is it board development? Is it bylaws? Is it committee structure, administrative and financial uh, operations? Those kinds of things, sort of the nuts and bolts. Um, the next might be, I would say, more strengthening than developing a partnership. Um, as Cheryl said as well, you have to be, you have to have a friends partnership agreement in place. You have to be an official friends group to enjoy the benefits of being in the mentor program. That's one of the reasons that uh, we have a friends partnership agreement so that we know that um, people are involved as friends. So it, this isn't for somebody who's starting up and wants to form a friends group and doesn't have their 501c3 yet. You have to have all of that in place. Um, so it's really about, it can be this number two, developing or strengthening the partnership, defining the roles, you know, who's supposed to be doing what, um, what are the, the goals that the service might have for the friends and what are the goals that the friends have for the service. Um, so really a lot about that partnership. Number three, I feel like is where a lot of focus might be right now, given the pandemic. And I always hesitate to use the phrase post pandemic. I don't know what stage we're in anymore. Um, in the world, but 
dealing with change and transition, obviously so much of what we're all dealing with now is, is this sort of new world order and structure. Um, along with that, changes in service staff and board members, we know that in these past couple of years, there's been a lot of interrupted uh, time and activity. So if people are trying to start things up again and have things be back in person or in a hybrid model, um, how do we deal with that change? So that is something that the mentor relationship can definitely focus on. Um, and the timing I think is really good there. Uh, and then lastly is the sort of crash cart, um, you know, a, a more of a triage situation. If you really, and that can go quite a bit uh, hand in hand with number three, I would say, especially in this pandemic era, um, revitalizing a partnership, or if you've lost uh, a lot of key board members or service staff, which we all know is also an ongoing issue. Uh, so those are the four priority areas. Um, Joan, if you wouldn't mind scrolling up and we'll just look at this real quickly. Want me to go up or down? It, well, sorry, page two. Okay. <laughs> so these are just the basic instructions. I'm not gonna walk you through all of this, um, but this is the stage of operations here of what you do. Um, you read and complete and sign the form. You send it directly to me. I work with the regional coordinators to talk through whether this seems like it's a good fit. Um, and then you get into all of the scheduling and preparation for the visit. And the, as Cheryl said, you know, this isn't just a, you know, figure out a visit, come and do the visit, and then you're done. There is pre and post work that's involved. Uh, scroll down, Joan, is that the right direction? <laughs> um, <laughs> So also um, the visit is paid for, the mentors are sent to the, the partnership area um, by the region that is the host of the group. So there's, there's no cost to the friends group. I think that's important to know. Um, but everybody again has to be really bought in to this um, as far as making sure it's a success. Um, the mentors are trained volunteers and service staff. And as Cheryl said, usually one person from a friends group and one person from the service. And everyone is doing this on a voluntary basis, um, but has been trained up to do it. And, and the mentors are just fantastic. I can't say enough good things about the people that, that serve as mentors in this program. They're knowledgeable, they're there to help, they're interested, they wanna see friends succeed, they wanna see the partnership succeed. Um, so you're getting great, you're getting great folks here. Okay, you can scroll down a little bit more. And then this gets into, you know, as I said, who might apply, that's it's for friends groups, official friends groups. Um, there are two cycles. Uh, March 31st was the most recent deadline and October 31st is the next deadline coming up. So we will um, post with um, on the CORFA site and Facebook and the um, Fish and Wildlife Service web pages and such, the new application that is for October 31st, probably by about mid-September at the latest. So people will have a full six weeks of time to look at the application and apply um, and can always ask questions in the meantime if things come up. Um, you it, Here we do say that you can talk to somebody about the program, um, including your regional coordinators, but really there's a lot of uh, folks going on details and such. If anyone has questions about the mentor program, please just come straight to me. Um, email is the best way to get to me since I'm never in the office. I've been there a half a dozen times in two and a half years, um, given the pandemic. So email me. Uh, I will promise to get right back to you. If you don't hear from me, email me again. Um, but you can direct any questions at all that you have about the mentor program to me uh, at any time. And then if you want to scroll down again, we are just looking at the application itself. These are the the basic questions, what do you hope to get out of this? Um, what are those priority areas you're seeking? And Joan, you can keep sort of slowly scrolling down. Why is it important to have a mentor visit? Um, give us a general description of your board. You know, do you have committees? What committees are they? Um, what staff positions at the service do you typically work with? Who are those folks? That sort of thing. No one from a friends group or uh, the refuge should be surprised by the fact that a mentor application has been submitted. Everybody should be aware of that beforehand. I mean, obviously the, the staff that you work with most regularly. Um, and then the last bits are really mainly um, signature blocks. If you want to scroll down again, um, 
this is where you uh, give us some dates. Typically, mentor visits occur over a weekend, but that's not required. Um, so you want to give us a, a selection of dates that might work here. Um, and we're not going to, this is a process that, that um, we go through to decide where, what the dates are. We're not going to dictate that and we're not going to hold you to, you said this is your first choice, but what works out is the third choice. It's very flexible. Um, and then here's the signature page. Uh, so that's, that's it for the application. Um, and again, this is the application from the last cycle. It will stay very much un, largely unchanged um, in this next cycle, but we're just having to um, configure the new application to be compliant and such. So it's not quite ready, but it will be very soon and you'll be able to access that within a few weeks. And you'll have, so you'll have at least six weeks between the time when the application is posted and is open and when um, we'll ask for those by October 31st. So we can go back to that last slide or the second slide of mine. Okay. Great. So selection process and next steps. Um, the application should be submitted um, via email to me. Um, and my email is all over the materials. Um, definitely don't mail it in. Um, People don't even know where my desk is necessarily. I have trouble finding my desk when I go into the office sometimes. So please make sure to email that. You can scan it for signatures um, and then email it in. You can send more than one copy if you wanna get the information in and then you have signatures on a separate page. However you need to do it is fine. Um, so October 31st, 2022 is the next deadline. And then the applications are reviewed um, by, the, by myself and the regional uh, coordinators, and then we select who seems to, you know, is, is a good fit. Sometimes there might be issues where it's, this is really outside the purview of what a mentor visit can do, not very frequently. Um, and then we work together. Um, we work on first on the uh, service side um, to figure out, to make the matches between the mentors and the what the visit is entailing. So we look at um, skill sets, geography. Um, I wouldn't. I was going to say personality, but not always personality. But more just who feels like a good fit for which groups, um, based on you know styles and um, skill base. Uh, and then we get in touch with the applicants to get the ball rolling, setting up phone calls, um, whether or not a mentor can attend a board meeting virtually, that sort of thing. And then all the logistics and plans are agreed upon. Like I said, that's usually the hardest part. And then the hope is that the mentor visit takes place within two to six months after that application process. So that's it from me. And I know I talked quickly about a lot of things and we'll look at questions uh, at the end, but thank you for having me here. And I'm, I'm not going anywhere, but I'm gonna turn off my camera so you can focus. Thank you, Linda. And now I'd like to turn it over to Debbie Parisi. Debbie is a member of the board of the Friends of California Condors, Wild and Free. And they are in, in the middle of a mentoring process right now. They've had their mentor visit and they're now in the follow-up phase. And so I thought it might be interesting for those of you who are perhaps considering a mentor, uh, becoming a part of the mentor program, um, to hear from somebody who's actually done it. So thank you so much, Debbie, and you can take it away. Thank you. Um, my name is Debbie Parisi, and I'm a board member at large for the Friends of the California Condors Wild and Free. Um, I've been working with the Condor Recovery Program since 2008, and that's also the same year our Friends group was formed. Um, we work in collaboration with the Hopper Mountain National Wildlife Refuge Complex, where the endangered California condor lives. And on my title page here, I have to do some advertising for our organization. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in condors, we have a website, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have YouTube. So there's lots of places to see photos and videos of California condors. And if you have Instagram, I'm really trying to get to a thousand followers. So please follow us. Um, next page, please. 
Okay. Oops, sorry, too far. How's yeah. that? There you go. Okay, so I was asked, you know, why did why did we want to apply for a mentorship program? And several things have been impacting our organization over the last couple of years. Uh, obviously, COVID-19, um, many events that we normally attend for outreach and education and lectures have all been canceled. Uh, the government has put restrictions on the National Wildlife Refuges. Um, our service offices are all closed. Um, the National Wildlife Refuges for the California condor, because it is an endangered species, are generally not open to the public. But as a friends organization, we've been allowed to do work days and tours, uh, as long as they're escorted with someone from the a service staff and a friends group volunteer. Um, we moved from meeting in person to virtual meetings and some virtual events. I have to say that I would say last year in 2021, I did probably 15 presentations uh, virtually over Zoom um, instead of having in-person meetings and lectures events. Um, we had a lot of changes in our staff and our board members. Um, in the mentor meeting, we actually had uh, six uh, staff that, that came to the mentor visit and five of those were new within the last couple months. So we had a big change in staff, including a project leader with the service. Um, and then the board members, we had multiple losses from people moving, retiring. We even had two deaths of our president and our, our former president and our, and our um, treasurer. So people with a lot of knowledge, um, lo knowledge lost. I think we found that we needed transition planning. We needed understanding of all the responsibilities each board member had and, and make sure that it was documented and we were able to transfer it to new people. Um, and the other thing that really affected us, we had a, a, a major loss of volunteer engagement. And, and what I mean by that is we used to have uh, monthly board meetings and at the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we'd have over 30 people. It would be like standing room only. Um, now we generally have seven people, maybe. Um, we have seven board members, so maybe not all the board members attend. Um, and then we have one, maybe two people from the service. Uh, we just have lost all that engagement with the volunteers. Um, and another reason is the, the Condor refuges are really remote. Uh, as they're des described by the staff, they're rugged and remote. Uh, it requires four wheel drive to get there. Um, they're not generally open to the public. And without volunteer activities or escorts on the on the site, um, we just lost that interest from volunteers. Um, we had been working on a volunteer retention and recruitment strategy over the last couple of years before COVID. Um, we did have a couple of trainings. Um, whenever we do an outreach event, we have people sign up that want to uh, volunteer and then maybe every six months we'd have a meeting and we'd talk about all the different volunteer opportunities and we would train people. Um, since COVID started, we haven't had any of those meetings. Um, so yeah, we, we needed help in transition planning. We needed help in revitalizing our organization. Um, I guess um, we needed tools and strategies to become proficient in environmental education, acquiring funding, retaining membership, appealing to volunteers for participation in events and helping us with administration. Uh, next page, please. The next slide is, well, the if you wanna go back, that's just a, a copy or a photo of uh, the, the mentor visit. Uh, there are six, of uh, service staff there, four uh, board members, and we have three mentors. Okay, you can go to the next. So I wanted to describe 
um, how we found the mentor process. Um, the timeline I was told is kind of advanced. We were lucky that we got our uh, mentor visit so quickly. Um, we submitted our application in April and we had a, a, our first mentorship listening session. Um, they also sat in on um, our board meeting, which was over um, virtual meeting. Um, we completed the visit preparation form. Uh, we had another mentorship listening session, which I think again was, uh, uh, that was when our board met. So they attended our, our board meeting and uh, we talked about the upcoming mentor visit. And then they uh, visited us in June. Um, we also have follow-up mentor sessions uh, scheduled. These will be all virtual, um, but just to uh, follow our progress on how we're coming with um, the objectives that we decided on with uh, the friends group and the service staff. Um, so we'll have a one month follow-up, three month, six month, and a year follow-up sessions with the mentors. Um, the day of the mentor visit, I have to say we were we were really um, excited. Um, they had a different um, ways of getting us to think about our objectives and our goals and and action items to uh, support those and ways to encourage everyone in the room to participate. Um, so the activities they came up with were I thought were really helpful. And we decided on four main objectives. Um, the first one was to develop uh, board and officer and committee job descriptions that we could use for recruitment. And we could also use that for transition planning. Um, we wanted to clarify the volunteer program uh, with the service staff and the friends group. Um, we generally, support uh, outreach education. Um, we do tours on the refuge. We um, do lectures. Um, we do work days. And uh, for a while we were doing condor nest monitoring. Um, so there were different volunteer opportunities, but because we had an all, all new staff at the service, we didn't know if those would be continued. Um, and what actually they needed, especially for work days. So um, we needed to really clarify with them the type of work that, uh, that they wanted and the type of volunteers that they needed so that we could provide those services to them. Um, we wanted to um, come up with a recruitment plan and how to train our volunteers so that they could be come project leads. So if we had an event at the Chumash Earth Day, we didn't have to send a board member to go get the supplies and then uh, meet volunteers there and train them uh, on site. We wanted to be able to get volunteers to be, attend several events and then become a project lead for those events. And then they wouldn't need a board member to escort them anymore or uh, mentor them. Um, we wanted to schedule meetings with other Condor focused organizations uh, and we to share how we do things and find out some of their best practices. Um, there's actually um, several different organizations like the Pinnacles National Park Service, um, the LA Zoo, the San Diego Zoo. There are different, uh, the you know, the friends of those organizations we wanted to do an outreach and kind of have a meeting where we could talk about best practices and how we can help each other. And then um, the follow-up, we talked about, there's four of them uh, that we've already had one in July and uh, the mentors worked with us to review our objectives and our progress that we've made with the action items. And they've also been able to um, I think part of this uh, is cut off. I'm sorry, something got cut off at the bottom. Um, so um, they were able during the follow-up meeting to talk to us about suggestions for any barriers uh, that we had found. And they also had some proven strategies for 
accomplishing our goals. So they found supplies, uh, information about, for example, um, on the National uh, Wildlife Refuge Association website, they found uh, job descriptions that we could use, like why we create the wheel. So they were very helpful in, in giving us suggestions and ideas. Um, the process, I, I have to say, was really well planned. And for us, it was surprisingly quick to implement. Um, the Friends Group collaborated with the Fish and Wildlife Service under the mentor direction to really come to a mutual agreement on a list of goal-oriented objectives. And the mentors really established a, a good timeline for us to um, complete successfully um, and then review our progress and, and guide us. Next slide, please. So um, what we've gained uh, from the mentorship so far, um, we really have approachable goals. We have something that we can work on and we can see our progress and we can see you know, how we tick off all those action items. And, and I, I have to say that um, the worksheet that they gave us, the SMART objective strategy, uh, really makes you delve into uh, measurable action items so that you know that you're progressing in, towards your goal. Um, I also feel that, especially since the, the five of the six people from the Fish and Wildlife Service are new, um, this really increase the collaboration between the friends group and the uh, friends wildlife service the fish and wildlife service um it really i think cemented uh, like we now have sh uh, shared commitments and goals and uh we were able to receive a project list from the project leader, which enables us to do better planning and, and hopefully successful implementation of all those projects that they want to accomplish this year. And sometimes some of those projects require funding, um, material purchases, for example, and training for people. Um, so it's nice to get that project list out front so that we can really uh, support them and be successful. And um, I really think that it, it, it's, it might sound minor, but it, it's been really sad, depressing over the last couple of years with COVID. And I, we really have a renewed sense of enthusiasm, um, the friends group, as well as the service. We, we really see uh, a plan ahead and, and we can see our progress that we're making towards that plan. And it really is a sense of renewal for us. So I'm really happy with that. Um, we're, um, we're really uh, strong now with our volunteer role documentation. Um, this uh, will really help us with our transition planning in the future and new recruitment training. Um, we've got really four clear goals and an action plan to implement them. Uh, each month we are tracking the progress, even though the mentor visits are only four. We meet every um, month with the Fish and Wildlife outside our board meeting so that we can track our progress and come up with uh, new um, strategies and, and action items to make sure everything gets accomplished. Um, the mentor workshop really increased collaboration between us and we're looking forward to um, working on more events in the future and more projects. We definitely have a clear path forward and this really increased our enthusiasm and we're really excited about the possibility of involving more volunteers in the future. And we just want to thank everybody from the mentor program. It was uh, it, it was really well worth it. We really appreciate your help. Thank you, Debbie. I forgot to say, ask you to put questions in the chat box. If there have been a couple that have come up that we've just answered in the box. but. Are, are there any questions from those of you who are participants? And if there are, um, if you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. I see a hand. Jonathan, can you unmute yourself? Go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, so Jonathan Manley from uh, Friends of Bosque del Apache uh, in New Mexico. Um, how much capacity is there uh, in um, the service to support the mentoring program? Uh, you know, if you get 400 applications, do they they all get 400 volunteers and, or, or is there a capacity of 10? I just want to get a sense of how, you know, what's the likelihood of, of being accepted into the, uh, into the program? Uh, I, can Linda, answer I think that. that's a question for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I've only been here a couple of years and we weren't doing mentor visits the first year or so or more. Um, I don't think the competition is so stiff that typically anyone, uh, there's a, a huge um, wait list or anything like that. Um, I think it's more often that there might be a request for something that doesn't maybe doesn't fit exactly. Like if somebody wants a mentor visit so that they're thinking that the mentors are gonna come in and you know write a strategic plan or something of that nature, which is not really what the, the visit is about. It's much more helping the group focus on, you know, how do you wanna move forward, et cetera. But um, we do have a, you know, a finite number of people. We have, um, between 15 and 20 as far as active mentors and that's made up of both service staff and um, friends members who volunteer and it is like I said you know it's all voluntary so it, it does have to fit um, and that's why the scheduling issue is really more the most challenging piece of it is finding times um, because a lot of our mentors um, are retired and so people are traveling a lot um, and so it has to be something that's going to fit but uh, if I would say if you take the time to work through the application, the friends and the service staff together and really identify what you need and look at a few dates, it's pretty likely that you will be able to have a, a mentor um, partnership. Uh, I, I don't know what the percentages would be, but I would say, I don't know, at least 75% probably. Um, we're not getting, you know, dozens of, of these applications. Um, and if it doesn't fit at the time, it's something, you know, we had several visits scheduled, two, two visits scheduled for right around the time when everything sort of shut down for spring of 2020. So those visits didn't happen until um, spring of 2022. So, but that's, I mean, that's certainly, I was gonna say that's not the norm, but I'm not really sure what the norm is anymore. So it does happen sometimes that we have to bump them back for particular reasons like that. but. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Though? Yes, it uh -huh. does. And, and would you know pretty quickly where whether your application had been successful? Um, yeah, you you would know within a few weeks or so to a month at the most um, that the application has been accepted. Then the process of of the scheduling and the matching and such that that takes a little bit more time. Yeah, understood. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you. Linda. Rolando, I see your hand up. I mean, I forgot to unmute. Um, <laughs> just curious, um, the mentoring group that visits, do they are they comprised of both friends and um, service mentors, or is it just friends? Ideally, no, but, go ahead. Linda. Sorry, go ahead, <laughs> no, you're fine. Go ahead. Ideally, it's both. It's a team. Um, comprised of one, one friends member and one service staff. Um, we have been trying to do visits with a team of three recently, only because we had mentors being trained over the time when everything has been shut down. And so I was doing virtual trainings with new mentors that we brought on um, during you know, 2020 and 2021 when really nothing was happening in person. Um, so maybe there was a third person to shadow, but if we can, the hope is that it would be one service staff and one um, one person from the friends community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Joan, did I miss questions any place that you see? I haven't seen anything else in the chat right now, Cheryl. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing any raised hands. Okay. If you do have questions afterward, um, 
Linda's email, my email, and I took the liberty of giving you Debbie's email. I hope that's okay, Debbie. In case somebody has a question for you after the session is over, please um, please feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Yeah, can, yes. can you use Jonathan. the friendsofcondors.org email? Uh, Sorry, I the, don't know. The, the, there was just one follow up. Um, can we assume that, that everyone in the service is as well briefed about the mentor program as we are now? <laughs> no. Good question. Yeah. That is a good question. Jonathan, this, uh, you know, NWRA is recording this and the recording of the webinar and a copy of the chat will be sent out to everybody who registered. You are more than welcome to share it. And we will also be putting in, in the resource section of the Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates um, website, okay? Excellent, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Debbie, we'll get, your, we'll get the email changed if you'll give us the one. If, in fact, if you'll just enter the one you want used in the chat box, that's probably the fastest way to do Oh, there you did already. Thank you, you read my mind, thank you. Okay, any, uh, any other questions? Because we have a nice surprise for you at the end if there aren't any other questions. Not trying to shut the questions down, but oh. um, yes. Cheryl, Sue. I see that Sue has a question. Yes, Sue. I was just wondering if there's any other refuges that have gone through the mentoring pro program that is on the chat today, on the Zoom meeting. Me even before maybe got on. Friends of Tualatin have. Friends of Tualatin have. And that's the group that I'm with. But I'm also a mentor, so I speak out of both sides of my mouth. <laughs> and there are some groups that have, um, oh, um, have gone through it a number of years ago, and their current board may um, may not have had that opportunity. And I'm seeing some answers in the chat box, uh, Friends of the Wichita's was, but it was before my time, says Lisa, and Kim says I did when I was at Crab Orchard. So did you have some specific questions for them too, or did you just, were you just curious? Well, I was just wondering how their experience was in comparison to what the, uh... Friends of Condors, have they had anything different or was it as positive as their, theirs was? Kim, do you want to respond to that? You're the one who has been through it before. Thank you. Hi, um, yeah, so I'm at Merritt Allen now and I've been here for seven years. So I went through the program at Crab Orchard a little while ago. Um, it was super positive, and I'm encouraging my current friends group to participate here at Merritt Island. Um, the one thing that I would say is that it was challenging to get the friends to agree to participate, <laughs> um, and they were reluctant to commit all of the time that was required. But then when the mentors came and visited us and met with them, um, they really liked it and they were instantly very on board. And it really helped us a lot with um, kind of planning for the future and thinking a lot about what we wanted our board to be like or their board, because I work with Fish and Wildlife Service. But, um, yeah, I think that they would say that they were glad that they did it. I mean, that's what it seemed like. Um, but it got off to a hesitant start. <laughs> Thank know. you, Kim. And, and Lisa says, and Lisa, do you want to unmute yourself and, and make your comments? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. 
Awesome. So um, it, it was before my time, um, but I understand from our uh, past president and the board members, the vice president, those that were there at the time that um, the overall visit was very positive um, and the legacy of that lives on. So for example, one of the um, things that came out of uh, the visit was a solidification of our bylaws um, and an update on that. So that's the kind of um, deliverable, for lack of a better word, uh, that came out of the visit that was very helpful and continues to shape the organization. Thank you, Lisa. And, and I can say for Tualatin River, it was really positive at the time we had our mentor visit. And one of the indications of that for me is whenever we hit one of those sticky points that boards tend to hit, every now and then somebody will say, do you suppose we could apply for a mentor visit again? So they did see that as a positive re resource for uh, getting through something that, had, that seemed more difficult than we could handle on our own. And um, I understand from Linda that um, if, you have been mentored before, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't apply again because boards change, staff changes, circumstances change. So um, we keep that in mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo that. It, it doesn't, you're, you're not off the table if you've had a mentor visit before. If there are other groups, um, if we had a lot of other applications at the same time from groups who've never had a mentor visit, then we might perhaps prioritize those. But like Cheryl said, we know that there could be a totally different board and different service staff on in place as well. So, okay, I'm not. Is uh, Joan or Sue? Are you seeing any additional questions? I don't see any, Cheryl. Thank you, Joan. No, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any. Okay, well, I mentioned that we had a special surprise and that is that Debbie has um, a few photos that she will share, uh, Joan will share actually, but Debbie, if you want to tell us about them, that would be great. This is uh, for those of us who enjoy learning more about condors. And Cheryl, I'm just wondering uh -huh. before we do that, Sue, do you want to give- a Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, thank you. Webinars? No worries. Let me um, just welcome everybody and uh, let you know we have a slate of great webinars coming up. On uh, September, we're going to have our quarterly call, Legislative Update by Libby Marking of the Refuge Association. We're very excited to hear about those new updates. In October, we're going to have our year-end fundraiser um, webinar, which helps to um, give you some food for thought about raising funds near your year-end, timely because it's October. And then November, we're going to be talking about the federal budget process. And gosh, do we we all need to hear a little bit about that because it, it it's something that we all um, find very important in what we do for friends. So we look forward to seeing everybody September, October, November, and uh, hopefully we'll um, we'll uh, have some good webinars for you. And I am going to start sharing the slides. Thank you. It's so difficult for me to be in a lecture and not talk about condors. <laughs> um, California condors uh, reach uh, sexual maturity from five to six years old. Um, they will, the mother will lay an, a single egg, but both parents will incubate the egg. Um, this is uh, a photo from a Pole Canyon nest about oh, 15 years ago. Um, it was it successful and the, the chick raised at this nest is now a mother herself. Um, the egg is about uh, 10 ounces. Um, can you go to the next slide? Sure. Condors, by the way, are about 20 pounds and they have the largest land bird's wingspan of nine and a half feet. Uh, this is a male and female, uh, they're both taking turns brooding uh, the chick and then feeding the chick. 
uh, one, uh, the male or female will leave and scavenge for food, and it could be gone for two to three days while the other parent bird is in the nest. Their nests are different. They're cavities. They're not something where they put sticks and build up a nest. So they can nest in caves or in cavities of redwood trees. And you want to go to the next slide? This is uh, a chick at four months old. Uh, I think he's cute. <laughs> I, know I was talking to somebody. I think condors are cute. Uh, he's. Uh, they will enter the nest, which is the, here it's a cave where they have to repel into the cave. They'll check on the health of the bird. They'll give him a stud book number to wing tag and also give them a GPS and radio transmitter so that we can track them since they are endangered species. Um, it takes them six months to fledge. The parents don't just kick them out of the cave. They will, the birds will, uh, the chicks will follow the, the parents for maybe the next six months. Um, so those teenagers that you just can't kick out of the house. Uh, they, uh, because of that, the parents will only have one egg every two years. So uh, it's just to let you know that current condor population in, in 1987, we only had 22 birds alive, none in the wild. They were all captured for a captive breeding program. Uh, they were started to release them in 1992, five years later. We now have over 500 condors, 300 in the wild and 200 in six captive breeding programs. So do folks have any questions? for Debbie about the condors. We do do lectures and we have uh, virtual lectures on uh, our YouTube channel if you search for Friends of Condors. Um, and I'm trying to get a thousand followers. So if you're an Instagram follower, please follow us. Friends of Condors. Um, and there is a, a, a live webcam on the Cornell Institute website right now. Uh, you, if you want to see a condor uh, cam uh, from Tom's Canyon and Hopper Na Mountain National Wildlife Refuge. I'm not seeing questions or hands because I can only see a few of you at a time. So if you have a well, oh, there, there I can see. <laughs> if you have if you have a question, please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, I see Sue's question about the getting the lead out of bullets. Uh, that's that's the biggest cause of mortality in um, California condors is lead poisoning. Uh, California. Um, had a AB 711 passed five years ago. It was a staged implementation over three years to uh, stop hunters from using lead bullets. They now are using copper bullets. Five years ago, when we talked about uh, lead poisoning to hunters, that they didn't seem to want to uh, change. But now when I meet a hunter in, in an outreach program, they talk about the copper bullets because um, there are this, almost the same price now. The prices come down. They work better. Uh, many people are using them. Uh, it's it really is making a difference. And uh, lead poisoning not doesn't just affect California condors. Any scavenging animal, so coyotes, eagles, turkey vultures, can hawks can all die from lead poisoning. But yeah, it's definitely come. It's coming along. It's doing much better. Clark, you had a and question? Clark, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any condors for states. Where, where they're located? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, other than California. Yes, there are. Um, we have two release sites in California, one for the Southern Flock, mm -hmm. uh, Bitter Creek. There's another one at Pinnacles. And we just started a third one with the Yurok tribe in Northern California on the border of Oregon. There's also a release site in Baja, Mexico. 
and there's a release site in Arizona at the Grand Canyon. Those birds have, tra have traveled from Arizona into Utah. So it's possible now you can see um, condors at Zion National Park in, uh, in Utah. And, and cool. Clark, I, as an Oregonian, I can tell you that we keep calling them, hoping they will come farther north so that we can have them in Oregon too. I hope uh, they start going to Oregon. Lewis and Clark saw them when they did their famous yeah. trip. They saw them up there. So it's possible that they'll they'll start roosting up in uh, Oregon. We're hoping. And and we had the Yurok tribe, uh, their, their release part, as part of our bird festival uh, a year ago, last May. So uh, we were very aware of that. And as I say, we keep calling. We hope they'll come up here. Is there any uh, bill in Congress to um, to get rid of lead and ammo nationwide, or is it that we can lobby Fish and Wildlife to make a determination on that? Or how can no, we? I, I don't know of any national law that's been trying to pass, but I got to say, you know, duck hunters stopped using lead shot because they knew they wanted to hunt ducks and they knew that there was lead poisoning. So I'm, I'm hoping that the hunters in the areas like the Grand Canyon every year, they um, they have different. Uh, uh, if you bring in your gut pile, they'll they have like a what is it called? Uh, you get a ticket, and so many like Cabela's and different organizations will donate prizes, and so they'll at, when you bring your your carcass back, uh, the gut pile because it has lead in it. They would give um, tickets and they could um, earn prizes. Anyway, uh, this kind of um, encouraged a lot more hunters in Arizona to start using non-lead bullets. And uh, the industry is getting much better now. There, at, at first, there wasn't enough bullets for all the different types of hunting guns, but there are now. Um, uh, there are. Um, Hunters for non-lead organization, you could go there and they have different videos talking about the different um, uh, ranges of bullets and, and they have videos on how they work. They've done, uh, you know, they have that big um, tank that they shoot into and it's got gel in it and they show how the, the copper bullet does not fragment. It just has a mushrooming effect. And the, and the lead bullets actually fragment to small pieces. And anybody mm -hmm. that eats deer on a regular basis doesn't want lead in their, in their meat. And, they, and it certainly, um, it doesn't, if you just have deer meat once a year, it's, you're not gonna get sick from lead poisoning. But if you're a subsistence hunter, people in Appalachia, people in Alaska, that it's much more common that, uh, elderly people or children could have problems with lead and in, in ingestion. And there is and some effort to get rid of it. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'll just do this real quick. Um, Libby from Refuge Association put out an alert in July asking people to submit their comments to Fish and Wildlife Service about station specific um, phase out of lead ammunition ammunition. So it sounds like Refuge System is taking a look at that. Cheryl? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's, I just wanted to say that I know National Wildlife Refuge Association has had an advocacy of take action on that. So uh, pay attention to those. If you're not signed up, you can go to uh, National Wildlife Refuge Association and sign up for their, their publications and you'll get action alerts for things that are um, that you can take, you can personally take action on, or that you can uh, have your group take action on. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, yeah, a quick question, follow-up question for Debbie. Um, what kind of effect is climate change going to have on the condor? Does it increase their range? Does it bring them, you know, under uh, under greater threat? Is it neutral? That's a really great question. And I think that we've already seen the climate changes affecting the California landscape through the increased wildfires. 
and that affects the condors. Um, then the Thomas fire that we had in Ventura County, uh, we had active nest and the, the chick did survive. It had a couple of fringed feathers, but it survived. The, um, the fire two years ago in the central flock actually destroyed Ventana's flight pen. And there were, um, I think there were 11 condors that uh, died. It was horrible. They, they just could not get uh, away from the, uh, the fire. So, yeah, it's, I think that's the biggest change that I've seen. And we still have environmental things like uh, there, there was a bunch of DDT dumped in the Pacific Ocean uh, probably 50 years ago, and it's still impacting California condors and eggshell thinning in the uh, central flock. So that is still um, being seen, that um, there will be failed eggs uh, because of that. But uh, we're still studying. Um, I think we still have uh, captive breeding programs. Those uh, chicks that come from the LA Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, the Baja Mexican Zoo, those chicks uh, are released a year and a half to two years after they've been raised in the zoo, uh, raised into the wild. So hopefully we're going to see more expansion. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't see in my lifetime seeing thousands of condors just because of all the different things that are happening in our world. But I'm trying to stay hopeful and, and Hopefully they won't go extinct. That's, that's, I'm sure of that. Oh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> okay, I think um, we're, we're a little bit past time, but I thought that many of you would enjoy the information and the photos that Debbie had, and we wanted to have a chance to share those with you. So, um, Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your participation. And take a look at that application and see if it's time for your group to apply for a mentor. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next month at the uh, quarterly legislative up brief. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity. Much appreciated. Thanks, Thanks Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Thanks Linda. Thank you, guys.